Good afternoon. I'm Tom Leonard, the university librarian, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Free Speech Movement Cafe. Um, this territory is very important this time of year. It's the flight path for the groups of uh, new Cal students and their parents maybe making their final decision about coming here. And the other thing we can be sure they'll get is a summer reading list to keep them busy. I look back at the reading list that was last distributed uh, with student input. So 19-year-olds were telling 18-year-olds what to read. And on that list was Michael Odachi's novel, In the Skin of a Lion. This puts 18-year-olds in the world of the Sri Lankan-born novelist who describes how workers built the infrastructure in his adopted city of Toronto, with one of those characters, an immigrant from Macedonia, whose English was modeled after the singing voice of Fats Waller. Now, if the reader needs help with any of those references, what will quickly pop up in, say, a Google search is that the immigrant character came from the failing Ottoman Empire, that Fats Waller has been called the black equivalent of Vladimir Horowitz for his improvisations, and that if you think Toronto was multicultural a century ago, just take a look at it now. What you need to navigate this kind of information as an 18-year-old, this kind of a welcome to Berkeley, is, of course, the American Cultures Program the program we're here to honor. For two decades, the American Cultures Program has been telling newcomers to Cal what to think about the roots of our common culture. Um, I should say not what to think about those common roots, but how to think about them. The lesson is to study each of those strands in the context of the others, to use all the best evidence, whether it is data from the social sciences or creative accomplishment from the humanities, and also to get into library collections to make sure you were finding the best sources. Um, or at least those were the, le the lessons apparent to me when I particip participated in the American Culture's faculty seminars one summer. I want to recall for you one of my classmates, John Jurdy, who went on to become the chair of the history department and then the Dean of the Social Sciences. As I think we all know, John passed away last fall, and this is a good time to note that he was then administratively responsible for one of the most engaging libraries on campus that has given great support to American cultures, the Ethnic Studies Library. For all of us who were on the faculty and who partic participated in those summer sessions, to gear up to teach American cultures courses, the knowledge we gained from our colleagues across departments and across disciplines was one of the greatest impacts that program had on us. The freshmen got their surprises from the reading list. We got ours from seeing what we were cooking up in our courses after our forays into the libraries. It leaves very fond memories. To get back to the subject of Canada and Toronto, our chancellor is with us. Uh, <laughs> and um, if there can be said to be a chancellor who was not here in the formative period of American cultures, but whose heart was always with the program, I think it's Bob Bergino. Welcome, Bob. <clears throat> Actually, the other night I was re-watching The English Patient, <laughs> Michael Andachi's great novel turned into a great movie, actually, uh, and uh, was thinking about him. Uh, anyway, it's just terrific to, uh, uh, to be here and uh, to be able to help uh, you all celebrate the 20th anniversary celebration of the American Cultures uh, program on campus. And uh, it's a pleasure to see many current and former faculties members, students, and staff here who are celebrating this milestone. Uh, and uh, I think it's true, Tom, I wasn't here in person, but I was here in spirit, uh, uh, pushing on similar uh, phenomena in uh, other academic environments. Uh, of course, I think 
everyone knows that American Cultures is a signature Berkeley experience. And it's become a national model for teaching and learning uh, experience centered on understanding the dynamics of social change that created and continue to create the U.S. in distinctive ways. Uh, it's an archetypal, groundbreaking Berkeley achievement uh, pioneered by student activism and forward-thinking faculty and senate. Um, and 20 years since its inception, it continues to be an important underlying foundation of an academic environment that seeks to promote equity and inclusion by exploring our country's past, its complexity, its diversity, and the dynamics of future possi uh, possibility. Um, in fact, I, I, uh, many of you probably had the same experience that I had almost two years ago when two of my daughters uh, sent me, gave me for Father's Day, Barack Obama's two books. And I remember reading dreams from my father uh, in which I then did an instant transformation and decided I would do whatever I could to help this person become president of the United States. And it was because he was the first national leader I felt actually understood our country's past, its complexity, its diversity, and the dynamics of future possibilities, and so clearly revealed in his book. So American Cultures was ahead of its time in some ways uh, in that sense. The American Cultures requirement was passed by the Academic Senate in 1989. Christina, are you going to show that? Oh, it's a handout. It's a handout. So. The surprise is the vote was so close. What was it, 227, 194? 194. 194. Uh, uh, and the requirement clearly. It was contentious. It was contentious, interesting. Uh, it was conceived of as providing the possibility for great innovation, chances to break through disciplinary boundaries, to use cunning ed pedagogy to help students gain a deep, deeper understanding of the diverse cultures of the United States through an integrative and comparative framework. Uh, it was instituted as a campus requirement in 1991, and now is the only campus-wide breadth requirement on the UC Berkeley campus. And the uh, AC curriculum enrolls approximately 9,500 students each year, so it's a you know, huge percentage of our undergraduate student body. The academic, the American culture requirement and the program have had a remarkable impact on the undergraduate curriculum as well as on the undergraduate experience at Cal. And I'm sure I don't have to tell any of the undergraduates about that. Since its inception, courses have been offered in more than 47 departments in many different disciplines at both the lower and upper divisional levels. Uh, the majority of courses are in the College of Letters and Sciences, Division of Social Sciences, but are also taught in almost every college and school across the university, including engineering, integrated biology, public health, and law. The AC requirement in whatever discipline it's offered prepares students to analyze critically the social, political, economic, and ideological world around them. The AC requirement is uniquely placed within the undergraduate experience as it fosters excellence in scholarship, study across disciplines, and pedagogical innovation. Its impact on curricular innovation is highlighted in the Moffitt Library next door in an American Cultures from Concept to Classroom exhibit, which you all are encouraged to go see. Uh, such innovation has been recognized with the establishment last year of, and I quote, the American Cultures Innovation in Teaching Award. And the first award was given to one of today's panelists, uh, uh, Professor Ingrid Sayer Ochi. The American Cultures Center also began the AC Student Research Prize last year, uh, designed to recognize the educational excellence of students in the AC classroom. Uh, and last year, the upper division prize recipients were a, a collective of students within psychology who produced a well-researched and written paper on the experiences of Cal's undocumented students. Uh, and in case any of you didn't uh, uh, get a chance to read that paper. I hope you were watching Good Morning America 
uh, on Sunday morning uh, because you may uh, know that and you can just go to the ABC's website that uh, ABC came to our campus and uh, several of our students led by, by one courageously declared themselves as undocumented students and talked about their life as an undocumented student here at Berkeley. Uh, there are then some comments by myself and by Senator Dur Durkin uh, and then a shot of a bunch of our undocumented students down at the Green Lining Institute and it's a very well done and inspiring piece which I hope is going to provide the strength of character that the Senate is going to need to pass the DREAM Act. The lower division prize recipient uh, in a Peace and Conflict Studies course created a detailed ethnographic history of multi-generational -gener Vietnamese and Vietnamese Americans. Uh, both of these prizes reflect the intellectually provocative nature of the AC curriculum and the breadth of possibilities created by the diversity of the departments represented within the AC curriculum. The AC requirement is a fertile intellectual site for pedagogical development which has led to initiatives, which I know Christina's particularly engaged with and proud of, uh, the Berkeley Engaged Scholarship Initiative. And Bessie, as it's known, is a co-directed initiative with CalCor and the Center for Berkeley, Berkeley Center for Public Service. Uh, it's a campus-wide program to support faculty innovation in developing community-based components to new and existing courses. Uh, Today, we celebrate that the American Cultures Curriculum is 20 years old. Uh, and it's hard to imagine not only that longevity, but such a healthy curriculum without the efforts of many people, some of whom are with us here this afternoon. Uh, some, unfortunately, are no longer with us, but we're vital to establishing the American Cultures requirement, and we want to recognize uh, several of those. Among them, please remember Barbara Christian, who was a professor of African American Studies, uh, Lawrence Levine, professor of history, John Geardy, who was mentioned earlier, professor of history, and June Jordan, professor of African American Studies. And so these are all people that we owe and unfortunately are no longer with us. So once again, congratulations on this anniversary and thank you. So, it is indeed a wonderful thing to see so many friends and colleagues here who have supported American cultures. Um, I'd like to thank you all for attending today's event. I'd also like to, to thank Professor Tom Leonard and the Chancellor, Chancellor Bergino, for their warm welcome and remarks. But before we get much further, it has to be said that this event's been the effort of many people behind the scenes, and I'd like to recognize particularly the efforts of the SM, FSM Cafe Lecture Series team, especially Iwe and Holman as well as the great work of the new program assistant to American Cultures, Hilary Powers. Thank you all for making today possible. So I have to say that I was a little nervous when thinking of the thought of standing here today and speaking. And the reason being that in my mind to do justice to any introduction of the American Cultures curriculum, especially on its 20th anniversary, I feel that AC should really be talked about as a history, a concept, a story, an expectation, and for so many, me included, a vital, surprising, inventive, and provocative element in Berkeley's intellectual life. So that's a lot of pressure, right? <laughs> so I let myself off the hook. So let me instead invoke some other words, some of whom have been mentioned, who provoke us to interrogate the history we've trodden, the environment American cultures has created, and the history we might yet create. The late Professor Barbara Christian, I don't think that anyone is prepared to teach AC. We're going to have to learn fast. Colleen Lai, professor in English. This course encapsulates the multidisciplinarity, the teaching approach we are all encouraged towards mastering, but few have the real facility to execute. Scott Saul, professor of English, our second recipient of the Innovation and Teaching Award. Scott's at the back of the room today. My challenge has been to teach a course pitched at two levels at once, to engage and challenge the most sophisticated of a department's majors while introducing new methods to those who've been ventured, who've never ventured before into this landscape. 
Talking about Professor Caroline Merchant's ESPEN 160 AC class, Professor Nancy Peluso, innovative methodologies of teaching, often experimental, questioning what formal might mean. Imagine a virtual meeting of minds between John Muir and Steve Jobs. And lastly, Ron Choi, the previous holder of my position, a colleague and a friend. Just imagine the faculty as a whole at a research university with such a wide range of subjects, voting to create a one-course graduation requirement on all of its already overburdened students. What single topic could be so important? Within this selection, there's testament to the unique nature of the AC curriculum. Firstly, the demands, pedagogical and intellectual, created by the high expectations of each course content. Also of the great campus importance which pa passing the AC requirement reflected 20 years ago. And lastly, using phraseology, which I don't think is too strong, testimony to the bravery and the courage that the requirement represents. The decision to create the requirement asked students, staff and faculty to create something very new. I wasn't on campus 20 years ago, I'm a baby. <laughs> but I do know that there were leaps of faith all around. You need a leap of faith if you believe that, by the way. That a curriculum could be generated to meet all students' graduation needs, that faculty could produce scholarship within the demands of the requirement, and that students would embrace yet one more demand before graduation, no matter how intellectually provocative. So in keeping with this need for many voices to represent the AC curriculum, the experience of it, and also the divergent expectations, I'd like to introduce the video testimonial created at an invitational student event held earlier this week. So this was an event that many of the students who were involved in producing put together. It's a four-minute four production. with such a wide range of subjects voting to impose a one course graduation requirement this happens happened to me this morning in my class so don't <laughs> worry Would you like me to flip the schedule so you've got some time? Yeah. OK. So we're, we're so on our feet, right? We can flip the schedule at the drop of a hat. So these kind of divergent perspectives, I also want to represent with one of the faculty featured in the Moffitt Library exhibit. As well as being a prolific spoken word artist, Aya de Leon teaches one of AC's most popular courses. Poetry for the People in the Department of African American Studies, a course begun by June Jordan. She's also one of the faculty involved with BESI, the new Engaged Scholarship Initiative. And if that wasn't enough, she was in the SF Chronicle yesterday. So congrats, Aya. You want to come to the stage? Thanks. Thank you. It's an honor to be here and a joy to be part of this American culture's tradition. This is a spoken word poem written especially for this occasion, and it's called Baseline. Can you all hear me without the mic? OK, good. OK, you need the mic. All right, I'll lean forward. Baseline. I'm a Berkeley girl. I grow up in the flatlands, get Berkeley public educated while this university thumps like a baseline soundtrack to my childhood. A scenic landscape for afternoon strolls to the record stores, a eucalyptus grove to shelter late night high school kisses. Berkeley in the 70s is a charmed place. After integration but before crack, the first US district to voluntarily desegregate schools but before Prop 13 cuts funding. No fences 
classes at Berkeley High's open campus, but charms have limits. Berkeley is part of American culture, just as sure as racial achievement gaps and higher test scores in the hills than the flats. I leave for college in 84, come back from the East Coast in 92. The ravages of Reaganomics have molded a harder-edged Berkeley with an exploding homeless population. A cyclone fence around Berkeley High proclaims a closed campus where folks will be kept out, held in, held back, or just drop out. Meanwhile, Southside campus merchants show lack of love for South Berkeley teens, but as a working young adult, I have no time for strolls to the record store, now CD store. No more kisses that taste of eucalyptus in textbooks. I move to Oakland, can't hear the bass line from Lake Merritt. Soon, I discover the East Bay poetry scene, from the Ashe Project to La Peña Cultural Center to Poetry for the People to Youth Speaks. The 90s mixes Berkeley's bass line into a hip-hop instrumental track to accompany words from young lips, where the community and the university sing in harmony. But in 2002, June Jordan passes away. We lose our living link, and the bass plays alone on the hill, acoustic, unamplified. I start teaching here in African American Studies in 2006. I step into a course that shapes young voices to speak personal histories and explore American cultures through poetry. But young adult poets out in the community and young adult poets on campus spit similar poems while they view each other with traditional town gown suspicion. But I know this dichotomy to be false because I'm a Berkeley girl, old school hailing from the 70s when the free speech movement was a recent memory in the city and can campus looked to each other for inspiration. They don't understand that I step onto this campus knowing too many young lyrical geniuses with menial SAT scores who had too many jobs in high school to get that GPA, so I say come. Come to Berkeley to learn and to teach because June Jordan showed us that anybody can write and anybody can teach and I become part of this tradition and this team. We have a class of student teachers now who go to Cal and Mills and Antioch and Leslie and Berkeley City College and folks who don't attend any school at all. We teach on campus and in Berkeley High and BTEC Alternative Continuation School and Community Centers because this culture, this young adult poetry culture is American culture like hip hop is American culture and activism is American culture, just as sure as the African American and, and Arab American and Native American poetry and history in our syllabus. And we fill off-campus venues with single moms and SUMA students and high school dropouts and aspiring MCs and Peralta College future UC transferees because we are all Berkeley. And I know this because I was raised up in this town. I still carry the taste of eucalyptus grove kisses on my lips and at age 41, I read with mad love for free speech hippies as well as hip hop and together we can plug an amplifier into the baseline to show the whole Bay Area that this is not a closed campus where Cal students learn that they are part of an arts activism academic tradition and when they leave this place they can become part of shaping American culture. I know this because I was raised up in a time of hope and strong social movements. I am a Berkeley girl raised up in this town and I wouldn't have have it any other way. Thank you. I knew I was so right. I had not to, you know, follow you to start and then you're allowed to come in. Uh, oh yeah, sorry. So if nothing, what Aya's work is showing us is kind of the living, breathing nature of our AC curriculum. So should we try the student testimony? Fabulous. Thank you. Just imagine the faculty as a whole at a research university with such a wide range of subjects voting to impose a one-course graduation requirement on all of its already overburdened students. What single topic could be so important? And I think that that statement itself speaks to the gravity um, of the kind of enterprise that the faculty and students were undertaking. The real aim of AC is to change what faculty members teach, not to change what students take. It was AC classes that really opened my eyes and helped me find my intellectual passion, um, helped me figure out what path I wanted to take 
By taking this course, I got to understand more of what goes on in the society around us today. I can see like the whole world from a different perspective that I didn't have before taking this course. It made me realize that there was not only information that I wasn't getting in my major, there was also an entire way of understanding, of studying, of thinking that I wasn't getting in my major. So for me, the American Cultures class um, led to an, the development of an entirely new perspective on everything. I ended up studying more the, the humanity of the subjects and not just the hardcore information of it. And so for this reason, I am very thankful that the AC requirement exists because my course truly pushed me um, to become a science major or to continue with, with science majors um, as an option, something I hadn't really considered for myself in high school when I was actively discouraged by my teachers to take science classes. In general, I think the American Cultures requirement is really important because, especially for someone like me who's a science major or someone who might be a major in math or chemistry or someone who might be in high, I think it's always important to step outside of your comfort zone and what you know and kind of try to see where someone else is coming from. The new requirement that was eventually passed as American Cultures did not segregate European Americans and the four other racial ethnic groups alongside. Euro-Americans were now implicitly alongside the other four groups in a comparative and integrative study. That stands alone in the nation as the only requirement of its kind. Taking my AC requirement was definitely like this opportunity to see that wait, there are different people in Berkeley. It's not just white people, it's not just upper middle class people, and there's, there's a lot of difference on this campus. Purely in the classroom, they are different because it seems that in AC classes, students are encouraged to engage with one another. Students will talk. One thing we learned in that class is like once you start taking ethnic studies, you can't stop thinking about it. I think that it is critical, critically important to recognize ethnic studies um, on UC Berkeley campus in a way that honors the struggles of the students from 1969 and 1999. You must, and all students who take these AC courses, must remember that they fought for this. They striked, they were beaten, they were jailed, they went on hunger strikes because they understood the importance of critically engaging the reality of racialization that continues to exist on our campus today. These students fought for ethnic studies and for AC because they understood um, that all students at UC Berkeley should have this opportunity to be equipped with the tools that critically engage racialization on campus, as well as making deep connections in their lives, their communities, and of their governing body, both domestically and abroad. I see you in the front, Irina, I see others. Thank you for taking part um, and giving up your midterm time. <clears throat> so, and to the main part of this evening's program, our faculty panel, I'll briefly introduce them and then I'm gonna give the floor to them, after which we'll have an open question and answer session. Professor Bill Simmons, Professor of Anthropology, cur currently at Brown University. He chaired the Special Committee on Education and Ethnicity, which provided the report and recommendation for creating the American Cultures Requirement. From 1967 till 1980, 1998, he was a faculty member in the Department of Anthropology here at Berkeley, where he was department chair and dean of the Division of Social Sciences. In 1998, he moved to Brown University as executive vice president and provost, and is currently chair of anthropology. And I just want to say a special thanks to Professor Simmons for coming from Brown, especially for this event today. Thank you. <laughs> professor Mark Brilliant, Assistant Professor here at Berkeley in the Department of History and Professor in the Program of American Studies. <coughs> Mark Brilliant came here to Berkeley in September 2004 and is currently revising his dissertation, Color Line, Civil Rights Struggles on America's Racial Frontier from 1945 to 75, into a book being published by Oxford University Press. Mark is also currently serving on the AC subcommittee. Thank you, Mark, for all your efforts with the subcommittee. 
Professor Waldo Martin, his professor also here of history at Berkeley, as well as being a prolific scholar, including most recently of No Coward Soldiers, Black Cultural Politics in the Post-War America, as well as Brown versus Board of Education, a short history with documents and the mind of Frederick Douglass, Professor Martin has produced, produced one of the first AC courses entitled Social Movements, Difference, Identity, Power in American Cultures in 1993. And more recently, has also co-taught history with Mark, History 139C. Um, I didn't mean to do this, but I might as well plug it. Both Mark and Waldo are in a panel, right, on Saturday for Cal Day, entitled Barack Obama and the Making of American History. So there you go, free plug. Um, <laughs> And lastly, Professor Ingrid Sayerochi, Assistant Professor in the School of Education here at Berkeley. Ingrid's research and teaching interests focused on urban education, the history of education, families, neighborhoods, and community organizations as educative institutions, and the relationships among school and beyond school learning contexts. She also teaches Ed 40 and 140 AC, for which she received the first, as the Chancellor said, AC Innovation in Teaching Award. She is also the current chair of the AC subcommittee, for which she is profuse profusely, greatly, wonderfully thanked. Um, so I want to turn this event over to my colleagues and my friends. If you could please welcome the panel. Um, at the risk of uh, dredging up some bad memories, uh, what I want to do in my remarks today is to place the American culture's requirement within the broader national context in which it emerged, specifically the so-called curricular culture wars of the 1980s and 1990s, which multicultural education initiatives like AC sparked. Proponents of AC referred to it as intellectual affirmative action. And in doing so, what they did was to link the proposed requirement to the controversial Supreme Court decision from 1978, the University of California Regents v. Bakke, which narrowly permitted but did not require the consideration of race and ethnic origin in admissions decisions. 10 years later, buoyed in part by Bakke, Berkeley marked the 10th anniversary of the Bakke decision with a demographic watershed in the history of higher education. The beginning of the 1988 school year saw the undergraduate student body become majority minority for the first time. And this was touted by the Office of Public Information here as not only a first for Berkeley, but probably at any other academically top-ranked US university. The university's changing demographics, in turn, compelled what Professor Simmons described as an urgent intellectual need to rethink how we deal with diversity. The content of the curriculum, Simmons and others argued, needed to diversify in order to better reflect the composition of the student body. Affirmative action in higher education admissions required a kind of curricular counterpart, intellectual affirmative action. Students must learn to understand society from a broadly multicultural perspective congruent with today's reality, declared Chancellor Ira Heyman in 1989, and they needed a required course to help them do so. Now, in choosing the term multicultural, Chancellor Heyman invoked a neologism that was fast becoming a mantra as courses, multicultural courses, spread across college campuses across the country in the 1980s and 1990s. Like affirmative action in higher education, intellectual affirmative action stoked heated controversy. And what remains in my remarks, I want to convey, capture some of the key positions in this contentious debate, beginning with the arguments advanced by proponents of multiculturalism and looking at three different critiques of it. Perhaps the foremost proponent of multiculturalism was Berkeley's own ethnic studies professor, Ronald Takaki. The American mind, as Professor Takaki put it, needed to be open to greater cultural diversity in order, in order to offset the multicultural illiteracy that afflicted it. One means to this end was, as he put it, the diffusion of ethnic studies throughout the traditional disciplines. Author of the first self-proclaimed multicultural history of the United States, 
Takaki touted multiculturalism as curricular for reform in the service of social transformation. The curricular reform involved teaching students to see events from the viewpoints of racial minorities who were, as Takaki put it, historically set apart from European immigrant groups and relegated to the margins of a history that has viewed American as European in ancestry. In the process, multiculturalism served a broader social purpose by revising the curriculum to reflect the dramatic change in the country's demographics. Multiculturalism would help ameliorate the intensifying racial crisis that accompanied that transformation, as Takaki's colleague, sociologist Bob Blauner, argued. Who could possibly object to that? Well, quite a few people, as it turns out. Foremost among these was William Bennett. I told you I might dredge up some bad memories here. Who was US Secretary of Education in the late 1980s. In 1984, he published a book to reclaim a legacy. And he presented what I refer to as the kind of cultural conservative critique of multiculturalism. We are, Bennett declared, a product of Western civilization and therefore the core of the American college curriculum, its heart and soul, should be the civilization of the West. In particular, he singled out the ideas of Enlightenment England, Renaissance Florence, and Periclean Athens. University of Chicago philosophy professor Alan Bloom echoed and amplified Bennett in his best-selling 1987 book, The Closing of the American Mind, which is perhaps the most famous or infamous book of the curricular culture wars. For Bloom, multiculturalism smacked of cultural relativism. What multiculturalists deemed a virtue, that is a curriculum of contested terrains of different points of view, as Takaki put it, cultural conservatives like Bloom denigrated as a vice an enervated equality reflected in, quote, the unwillingness and incapacity to make claims of superiority. Whereas multiculturalists reviewed culture as a debate, cultural conservatives viewed culture as a canon, a fixed body of generally recognized classic texts. That the authors of these great books so happen to be dead white men of European descent, dweems as they were referred to derisively, was beside the point to cultural conservatives. For them, the greatness of the great books had nothing whatsoever to do with who the authors were, but what they had to say, the universal questions they asked, and the timeless answers they gave. A second major critique of multiculturalism was mounted by a group I referred to as civic nationalists. In contrast to cultural conservatives, civic nationalists did not dismiss multiculturalism wholesale. On the contrary, they embraced actually a number of basic premises of multiculturalism. As historian Arthur Schlesinger Jr. noted in his best-selling manifesto, The Disuniting of America, published in the early 90s, of course history should be taught from a variety of perspectives in order to help counterbalance a history long written in the interest of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant males. The different perspectives these different histories afforded would help students recognize how the curse of racism, as Schlesinger put it, was the great failure of the American experiment and remain the crippling disease of American life. At this juncture, however, multiculturalists and civic nationalists parted ways. Multiculturalists were content to stop with different viewpoints that would spark intellectual clashes out of which students could search for truth, as Takaki put it. Civic nationalists, however, had their own progressive truth about the overarching trajectory of American history that they believed ought to be imparted to students. Namely, that over time, the crippling disease of racism claimed diminishing numbers of victims. As Schlesinger declared, the steady movement of American life has been from exclusion to inclusion, the creation of an American unum out of an ethnic and racial pluribus. This march of progress, civic nationalists maintain, owed to the kind of curative and the cohering power of America's civic ideals. Though historically flouted, 
the great unifying Western ideas, as Schlesinger put it, of individual freedom, political democracy, and human rights, which were enshrined in America's founding documents, contained the self-corrective self power that allowed for the ineluctable expansion of America's circle of we, as in we the people. Simply put, America in practice, civic nationalists believed, increasingly approximated America in theory. And as an aside, um, this was a vision, a kind of meta-narrative of American history that Barack Obama touted over and over again, not only in his published works, but on the campaign trail. The third, and for my purposes, final critique of multiculturalism came from a group of self-described cosmopolitans. Unlike civic nationalists who tended to take for granted the categories in which multiculturalism trafficked, cosmopolitans raised concerns about the limitations of the categories themselves, the categories of American cultures. Multiculturalism's privileged collective group identities, according to Kwame Appiah, professor of African American studies and philosophy at Harvard, were not only too few in number, but they were also too narrowly construed within each of those categories. They were, as Appia wrote, remarkably unsubtle. Moreover, they came with what Appia called scripts, notions, that is, of how a proper person of that kind should behave. Multiculturalism endeavored to flip those scripts. It sought to transform the negative life scripts, as Appiah put it, historically foisted upon, say, African Americans into positive life scripts. That is, to keep the collective identity, but to invert its negative historical associations. While sympathetic with this effort, cosmopolitan critics of multiculturalism, like Appiah, like Berkeley's uh, history professor David Hollinger, worried that even positive scripts ran the risk of being, well, too tightly scripted. Appiah warned, I'm quoting here at length, demanding respect and recognition for people as blacks and as gays, for example, requires that there are some scripts that go with being an African American or having same sex desires. As a result, there will be proper ways of being black and gay. There will be expectations to be met. Demands will be made. It's at this point that someone who takes autonomy seriously will ask whether we have not replaced one kind of tyranny with another. Ironically, then, in the name of promoting diversity in one way, multiculturalism, according to its cosmopolitan critics, threatened to thwart it in another way. It's on this note that I want to draw my remarks to a close with one final comment apropos the cosmopolitan critique of multiculturalism. As we think about not the past of AC, but the future of AC, the big question for me is how a requirement that was codified in a particular place at a particular moment with a particular understanding of the salient categories of American cultures can adapt to changing conceptions of the salient categories of American cultures, and whether in the process of that adaptation, that necessitates another student-driven and or faculty-approved referendum. Put another way, if a big impetus for the original requirement was that the content of the curriculum needed to better reflect the composition of the student body, how, if at all, should the requirement adjust to reflect an ever-changing composition of students and the ever-changing conceptions of cultural identities they possess. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, I really look forward to reading the book that you're working on on that subject. I think the 1980s were an extremely interesting time uh, with regard to uh, ideas about education reform in the United States, probably, probably there was never a time in the century when there was so much concern about reforming undergraduate education as this period that, that Mark is describing. And I think the intellectual light that you're shedding on it and the way in which the arguments break down and so forth is really good foundational work. And I look forward to seeing your book when it's done. Um, 
the, uh, <clears throat> the one, one, of, one dimension of the 1980s, of course, was that uh, undergraduate student bodies at Berkeley and elsewhere in the country became diversified uh, racially, culturally, and in terms of income in ways that they had never been diversified before. That is, American undergraduate student bodies suddenly changed in the 1980s. So the campuses were visibly different. They were statistically different. The whole place, campus was a different place. But at the same time, uh, campuses, <clears throat> Uh, and Berkeley was not alone in this regard, were inhabited by uh, faculty members uh, who belong to academic disciplines uh, who, took, who take years to learn what it is that they're doing uh, and take years in terms of developing their careers to develop the ideas that they began with as graduate students and that they're interested in and so forth. And, and <clears throat> within these academic fields, change happens very slowly. Um, so on the one hand, you've got a confrontation between a student body that had never been present on the Berkeley campus or any other campus before. On the other hand, you've got a faculty who've been working along in their intellectual traditions. Uh, but what's interesting about this setting is that these intellectual traditions, by and large, were developed by faculty who were culturally homogeneous in terms of their own cultural backgrounds, their own educational backgrounds. And their teaching was done in front of classrooms of students who also themselves were culturally homogeneous. Uh, and, and so it was easy for them, on the one hand, to find rapport, and also easy for them to agree as to what the story was that was being told. And after a while, the story becomes codified, and it becomes the truth. But what happens then when you change the audience, and you've got people sitting there who either hadn't heard that story before, or felt left out of the story, or felt that the story in some way was distorted, or there are ways in which the story was, communi was being communicated that in some way was naive, and so forth. So here we have, I think, the kind of like the pressure point in the 1980s where students around the country, undergraduate student bodies around the country, were becoming sensitive to what it was going on in the classroom, were becoming sensitive to what was being taught in the academic disciplines in a way that had never happened before. Faculty have never been tested before, I think, in the whole history of American education in just this way. So, of course, the ideas for what to do about that didn't come from faculty. They came from students, by and large. I mean, they were the ones who were feeling pushed out of shape. And they were the ones who were sort of wondering, you know, do I really belong in this institution, and, and so forth. And, and uh, so students around the country began to develop initiatives as to what to, what to do about that. And there was a huge, a huge sort of ebullience of that interest in private as well as public universities all throughout the whole UC system. Uh, and, and one of the common ways in which students sought to do something to change the situation that they found to be in some way in need of improvement, intellectual adjustment, shall we say, uh, a rethinking of the ways in which the disciplines were carried on and, and, and rethinking of some of the ideas of the limited ways in which the disciplines had portrayed American experience. Uh, so began making suggestions, and one of those suggestions was that we need to expose everybody to understanding, to a better understanding of racial and ethnic and cultural diversity, and therefore we should uh, require an ethnic studies course, or therefore we should require a course on, on foreign cultures or something of that sort. <clears throat> so there were ideas like this bubbling up all over the country, taking shape and be going through academic senates as they were in Berkeley and every place else. And so this is a widespread debate that was going on here, but it was also going on everywhere. Uh, so after, I guess, a few cycles of students recommending changes in, in uh, the undergraduate curriculum at Berkeley, the Academic Senate decided to do something about it. And of course, what do you do to do something about it in a university? You appoint a committee. And uh, so they appointed a committee. And one day, I was sitting in my office in the anthropology department, and the phone rang. And it was Russell Ellis, who was one of the people in the chancellor's office at the time. And he said, we have a committee we'd like you to surf on, and it's, it shouldn't be too difficult, and so forth. And we want you to <laughs> think about these things. Some very good people in the committee. I see one of them there in the back of the room, Charles Henry. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so he'd, he'd like us to get together. And, 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 and the charge of the committee was to look at all these things that were happening elsewhere in the country and, and uh, try to listen to Berkeley students and see what they were doing, and then make some recommendations. That was our charge. And, and so we did that. <clears throat> and uh, so we hired a student, and the student 
uh, acquired syllabi and course materials and so forth from you know, any place that we could possibly find them. Stuff like that wasn't online. It wasn't so easy to get back in those days. But nevertheless, we got a whole ton of material and we looked at it. And basically, what it came down to in terms of models was that uh, either you had places with some kind of a, canon a, canonical, a canonical undergraduate curriculum where there's a great a form of a great, great books or Western civilization or some other such way of uh, sort of like communicating the signature academic programs for undergraduate education in that institution. Stanford was one of those. Chicago was another, for example. Um, <clears throat> And so places that had these types of canonical Western civilization types of requirements were being pressured to add another book at the end of the course or, or <clears throat> add a few films uh, in some of the classrooms and so forth. And so that created a lot of attention. The media were at Stanford for months during all of that because Stanford was going to change three books in one of their American civilizations courses. Uh, I mean, uh, Western civilization courses. Or maybe it was two books. Uh, but in any event, uh, it, it attracted a lot of attention. People felt that something really big was at stake, although nobody was really totally sure what that something big really was. Uh, but it, and the ethnic studies requirement was another approach. Um, and, and the idea that any foreign culture would do, it didn't even have to be about American culture. It could be some course on, on you know, me medieval Javanese music or something like that. They would help to broaden your horizon, develop cultural literacy, and so forth. And so our committee looked at that, and we weren't really too impressed by that. First of all, it didn't change the university much because it just took a bunch of courses that were already there uh, to begin with. I mean, you didn't have to rethink something that already exists, and then it told, it had, you know, told people to take these courses, and they could have taken them anyway. So we didn't feel it really added anything significant to what it was that universities did, and it certainly didn't involve any rethinking of anything. Uh, so as, as we talked, one of the things we did actually, it was probably the most interesting thing, it was the kind of a turning point in our committee's activity, is we held a big, large open meeting uh, in one of the lecture here, halls here on campus, I forget which the name of the building now, I've been away for 10 years, uh, where students were to come and, and just give their own ideas about the curriculum and why they were interested in the curriculum, what their suggestions were and so forth. And over and over and over again, we heard basically the same story that I came to Cal, I'm a first generation student, a second generation. Nobody in my family has ever been to university before and so forth. And, and I'm, real, I'm really interested. I'm, I like taking courses on the United States. I am an American. But yet, when I take courses on the United States, I have the feeling that a lot is left out, like including me and the whole cultural tradition from which I originate and so forth. And, and uh, so we listened to that. And, and uh, so we decided that we weren't going to require a foreign cultures course. We didn't see any point to that. We weren't going to require an ethnic studies course. The ethnic studies faculty had their own objections to that based on the grounds that their entire department and discipline would be turned into a service department, which they didn't really want. And they really weren't sure whether that would solve the problem of these other academic disciplines going on their merry, antiquated ways, doing the same things that they had done in these homogeneous faculty, homogeneous student environments for years and so forth, that any, any ethnic studies course would not really have any impact in what was going on in the other fields anyway. In fact, it might get them off the hook. Um, so we thought, well, maybe what's needed is a new kind of a course. And we thought about that. And OK, now what kind of a course would this be? Uh, well, it has to, and, and then, then it got down deeper into what is the problem that we're trying to solve in the first place? What is this thing that we're trying to look at that, that we think that there's an answer to, <laughs> which had not really been clear? And, and uh, so the thing we're trying to look at to find out what there is an answer to is, is how you talk about the cultural construction of the United States. I mean, that's basically what it came down to. You've got an unusual society, as most New World societies, it's made up of people who come from all over the planet, all kinds of different religious backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, language backgrounds, and so forth. Somehow or other, within a system of government and with a revolution and a variety of other types of political, historical, and economic developments, all of this is welded together in some form of a society, which is us. Um, so we felt that what we need is a way of looking at the society that takes some account of the way in which the cultural composition, the cultural origins and roots of the society are manifested in that society, not only in better understanding its past, but also where it, where it is in the present and where it might be going in the future. So we saw that as the big problem that we were interested in. And we felt that if any place could make a contribution to solving that problem, it was Berkeley. 
because for years Berkeley had an African Americans program, it had a Native American studies program, it had a Chicano studies program, had a, a uh, um, Chicano studies program. What did I leave out? Asian, Asian American studies program. So Berkeley had these programs already. Uh, so we had something to start with. And so we felt that if anybody could really try to think about organizing new courses, that could, it could happen here. Um, so in our you know, sort of first version of that, we thought, well, whatever this is, then it's got to be comparative. It just can't be a course about one group or another group. It's got to be a course that deals with issues of American experience, but in some way that takes account of more than one group if you're going to be talking about the cultural construction of American experience. So the magic number of American culture, Western culture in general, is three. So, so we said, well, you need to have three cultures. You need to have, we're going to have one, which is the mainstream culture, whichever that is. And then, and then you've got to have two minority cultures. And so then uh, by doing that, that you sort of lock in the fact that it's going to be a big picture course on something or other, and it's going to involve minority viewpoints and minority experiences and so forth. So we were really proud of that. And we brought that idea to the Academic Senate. And uh, we rolled that out on the stage. And, and chaos began to break out. Speeches on all kinds of subjects, like why health was more important than ethnicity. And I can remember somebody in the, uh, in the French literary philosophy department, I don't remember, saying that he remembers that when someone came to his department to talk about French philosophy, he said, I told him, there is no French philosophy, there is only philosophy. So I thought, that guy needs a course in anthropology, but it was exactly that issue. <laughs> It was exactly that issue that we were trying to, to work with. I'm an anthropologist. Um, so anyway, we presented that to the faculty, and, and they had like a collective uh, freak out of some sort. It was, it was unresolved, and it was deferred. It was the last meeting of the spring. It was deferred to the following year. Uh, and they were going to put it to a mail ballot because they felt that it, with a mail ballot, you could get all the people who are really, really opposed to everything, who don't even come to meetings, and they would vote against it, and therefore the thing would be done away with. But it turns out that within the, the rules of, the fact of Berkeley's Academic Senate, you can't do a mail ballot. So our committee, in other words, was recommitted for the following year. So we talked some more, we talked some more, to, to talk some more. But one of the criticisms that the faculty did have, and I think it was a legitimate one, is that our thing about the mainstream culture and two minority cultures really did set up a kind of us versus them potential for the, whatever that course was. So these courses would then turn into sort of good versus evil and all the rest of it. And we didn't really want to get into that paradigm either. So we thought about it. What we decided was that we'll just recommend that these courses have to deal with some kind of significant element, aspect of American experience. It could be music. It could be language, poetry, novels urban government, I mean, you name it. It could be any of those things. Forestry, it turns out forestry was one of the big departments because our parks are being used by so many different types of ethnic communities that they have to have figure out different ways of having park rangers and so forth. So I mean, it was an issue that was really out there in many, many different places. Um, so what we decided, OK, we're not going to say mainstream, minority, any of that kind of stuff. We're just going to say we want to have this course be comparative. Um, and by comparative, we don't mean comparative within African American or comparative within Native American or comparative within European American. We want it to be structured in such a way so that no matter how it is, it's got to be comparative in some larger grammatical sense. Now, how do you do that? Well, you do that by specifying, you know, someplace, uh, statistically speaking, sort of the modal points of what it is you want to compare. So what are, we, how, what are those modal points? We picked the categories according to which ethnicity was basically structured at Cal. European American, African American, Asian American, Chicano, Latino, Native American, and so forth. So we said it has to include at least three of these groups. Whatever the issue is, you've got to take account of at least three of these groups. Which group you pick, whether, and, and I just want to say that it was with no illusion that any of these groups were some kind of a monolithic, culturally homogeneous, um, absolutely true to stereotype community of people with sharply broad drawn boundaries that marched in certain formations and wore the same clothes. We weren't really thinking that, but rather we were thinking that we wanted to structure it in such a way that no matter what you set up, you threw a big net and not a narrow net. So that's how it ended up. And, and uh, 
So then we went back to the Academic Senate. We talked to faculty members. We had meetings and so forth. And each time that we would meet with a group of faculty who were arguing against this, they would change their minds. <laughs> they said, well, there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's a good idea. And Ron Takaki and I went out to the sororities and fraternities all over the campus. And there's nothing wrong with that either. It was a good idea. They thought it was a good idea. So we took, anyway, we took it to the Academic Senate, and they voted for it. Now, here's the really interesting part of it. And, and, and that is that, and I realize I'm taking too much time. But <clears throat> it's been 20 years I've been saving it all up. <laughs> um, the really interesting part of it, and it's not a part that was really like thought about much at the time, but there were no courses that could do this. We were, we were rolling out a requirement, basically, that didn't, there was no course, I mean, the whole idea was that this is something that had to be done, that should be done, that only Berkeley could do, but there was currently nobody doing it. So we got a handful of faculty members put together courses with syllabi that were sort of like proto version, prototypical versions of it. We went to the Academic Senate and we actually did get the vote. And so I read into that vote. Fa faculty, maybe they knew that we didn't have the courses, maybe they didn't, I forget whether that was clear or not. But I read into that vote that the faculty wanted to make this work. And so it passed. And we had one year to start it up with the incoming freshman class. So we went to work. We created a course development program and so forth. Faculty signed up for it. Generation uh, through the summer, they worked month after month after month for the first five years. Ron Choi there orchestrated all of that. Really, really got it going. I would say by the end of the third year, we had maybe 40 departments, maybe 150, 200, 250 courses. The number of courses just kept exploding. So the final thing I want to say from this, um, is that um, this was deep change in the way in which American experience was thought about and the way in which it was translated into the classroom. And it didn't, and, and the thing that amazes me is that I've been in academic administration for a long time and any time any academic organization wants to change something, they bring in a consultant, they have a strategic plan, they get big pads and they, and they write things on the pads and, and nothing ever happens of any real imagination except that they time it over a five-year period, how they're going to do very little. <clears throat> but this was, no, this, was no, this was no strategic plan. This was just a group of faculty getting together. But there was energy behind it, and that's the important thing. There was energy coming from the students. They had a legitimate reason for being concerned. They didn't really have the right solution to the problem. But when the problem finally bubbled out between conversations, between back and forth for two years, it took two years, when it finally came out, I think we came out with something that was really, really good and that only Berkeley had thought of. So there it was. We got the courses going and, and uh, it's still here. And I'm really happy to see that it still exists. So thank you. I think I'm supposed to talk about my experiences teaching um, an AC class, and I want to confine those remarks um, to a very brief compass. Um, I came here in the early 90s from the University of Virginia. I had been teaching um, African American history. I'd been doing civil rights, black power. Um, and the opportunity to teach um, an AC class totally revolutionized um, my scholarship and teaching. Um, I, um, I was in one of these summer programs that was supposed to help you to think through how you were going to do this. I was in a faculty development program one semester. And essentially what I created um, was a class that um, a colleague um, had a version of in ethnic studies, Car uh, Carlos Munoz. We were very interested in social movements of communities of color. And so essentially, um, he's very political and <laughs> into political economy. I'm very social and cultural. So um, I was very interested in trying to think through uh, the relationship between the African American civil rights black power movement, the Asian American movement, the Native American movement, and the Chicano movement. And so that's essentially how this um, experience uh, shifted the ground under me because I came here essentially as an African Americanist. And I think for the last, for, for my whole experience here, part of what I've been doing is trying to think uh, about and understand and write about uh, how all of these experiences come together in some kind of way. Um, the class uh, has shifted dramatically 
Initially, um, I relied very heavily on uh, guest speakers, um, especially the first several years. Um, and then I got to a point where I felt comfortable standing up in front of a couple hundred people talking about the Chicano movement, right? <laughs> La Raza, you know. Uh, but it took me a while to get to that. Um, but I think um, American cultures enable that, um, and I'm extremely grateful for that. Um, the other thing that happened um, is that um, after about a decade, then I figured, well, this is interesting, but I'm boring myself. Um, so I figured there's some other ways to teach this class. So I was constantly tinkering with it. And um, I would say the best thing that happened to this class recently was Professor Brilliant. Um, we, we hired Mark, and Mark and I started talking, and we said, you know, we could do this class where um, you know, you could do that bottom-up thing, I could do that top-down thing, and we'd meet somewhere in the middle, right? Um, and we've experimented with this um, several semesters, and I think last time we finally got it right. Um, but um, it really re-energized my whole approach to thinking about uh, social movements, especially by thinking about um, some of the issues that Mark brought to the table, especially policy issues, especially trying to think about top-down um, developments. Um, and so for me, when I think about the work that I've done since I've been at Berkeley uh, as a professor, um, this has been sort of um, some of the most gratifying and intellectually stimulating and important work that I've engaged in, and I'm enormously gratified uh, to be here to bear witness. Um, and um, the thing that I really want to do, however, is to bear witness. Um, I was very glad to hear someone mention Barbara Christian. I was very glad to hear someone mention June Jordan. Um, I'm sure we could all continue to go on with people. I'd like to add, throw into that mix Veve Clark. Veve and I were graduate students together. I knew her when she was Pat back in the um, 70s. And so um, there was a certain connection there. And um, all of these sisters in struggle, I would call them, uh, Barbara, June Jordan, and Veve, were very important when I re uh, returned. And I think June came a little bit later, but Veve, I think, was here. And I know Barbara was here. And um, one of the things that really got me going was Larry Levine and Veve were teaching a class which was really about conceptions of American culture. And Larry said, well, I can't teach this class. Um, you're going to have to take over. Uh, okay, Larry, <laughs> my brother. Uh, so um, it, that never happened, but Larry gave me this thick book, which was the course reader, and he said, you'll have to teach this with Vivi. And so Vivi and I started having these conversations. The course never um, happened, but what I'm trying to get you to think about is sort of those kinds of connections, very important to me. Larry Levine, Ron Takaki, and um, it, all the many, America is in the heart. I came to Ron, I, I, gotta, I gotta get a book, I gotta get a book. Ron gave me the book, you know, um, Carlos uh, Bulasan, you know, and it totally sort of just, you know, blew my mind. And this is, was constant with me in, Amer uh, in American cultures. You'd go into these seminars with people around this campus and it was, I mean, I have a pretty good department, but my mind was, is very rarely blown over there in Duenel. My mind was <laughs> blown on a regular basis in American cultures. Um, the one thing I'd like to do before I um, end is just to bear witness, because I think we've had a lot of talk about how revolutionary, in a sense, this was. And I'd just like to read some of the, the language, because um, yeah, I, mean, I really bow down to both Ron Takaki, uh, the historians that have shaped what I do, Ron and um, Larry Levine. And I just want to read sort of what I think is most important about this. Um, these, these categories, these ways of making classes, you know, all of that's great. But what's most important to me is the spirit, is the humanity, uh, that, and the passion that inform their teaching and their scholarship, and an angle of vision, a perspective, a way of being, thinking, and acting in the world. And I think for me, American cultures uh, has embodied that. And I just want to read a little piece of the introduction um, in um, A Different Mirror. 
Reflected in a mirror without distortions, the people of multicultural America belong to what Ishmael Reed described as a society unique in the world because, quote unquote, the world is here, a place where the cultures of the world crisscross. Out of this intermingling arose a poem by Langston Hughes, so succinctly, so sonorously, the black poet laureate captured our multicultural memory. Let America be America again. Let America be the dream the dreamers dreamed. Say who you are that mumbles in the dark. I am the poor white fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery's scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek. Oh, let my land be a land where equality is in the air we breathe. The struggle to let America be America has been America's epic story. In the making of multicultural America, the continent's original inhabitants were joined by people pushed from their homelands by poverty and persecution in Asia, Latin America, and Europe, and pulled here by extravagant dreams. Others came here in chains from Africa, and still others fled here as refugees from countries like Vietnam and Afghanistan. And all of them belonged to the great migrations that made the American people. When I think about American cultures, what's most important to me is the spirit and the insight that informs this kind of vision of America. And I'll just end with uh, a short piece from Larry's book, The Opening of the American Mind. Um, I mean, I, I remember many conversations with Larry about a whole bunch of things, but the title of this book is one of them. And um, it's clearly <laughs> a jibe at Alan Bloom's The Closing of the American Mind. And Larry's idea was he was back there in the 40s and the 50s when things were supposed to be so great at City College in Columbia, and that was simply not his understanding. He thought that what was happening at Berkeley in the 80s and the 90s was so much greater, so much, um, you know, so much, it gave students so much, uh, such better education. And he, he goes on and on and talk about this. And he talks a lot about some of the things that Bill was talking about. But it is precisely because this, this is uh, Larry, it is precisely because the changes taking place in the nation are so manifest in higher education that universities have become prime targets for those frustrated by the shape and texture of modern America. The contemporary university with its rich array of courses and programs, its dedication to expanding students' understanding of the diverse cultures and societies that surround them has been drawn into a whole range of, of, of courses and then he go, uh, uh, of struggles. And then he goes on to talk about how rather than seeing what uh, Bloom and the critics see as sort of the closing of the American mind, and he gives a whole bunch of these titles. I love these, these titles. Um, you know, all of those books, you know, the you know, disuniting of America, you know, these really, really negative characterizations. Larry was full of hope, optimism about uh, not only American cultures, but the changing face of America and how that changing face of America should not only be reflected in the curriculum, but also in the ways in which we uh, live uh, and, and understand uh, one another. So um, as we think about sort of this requirement, I just would like to keep alive not only the memory of people like Barbara and June and Veve and Larry, but to also honor people like Bill and I see a whole bunch of uh, comrades in struggle uh, who helped to make this uh, uh, requirement a reality. And I think we all owe them a, a, a big uh, debt of honor. And I just want to bow down. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Um, and before I begin my comments, I want to first say that teaching an American cultures course here at UC Berkeley is the greatest joy and privilege of the work I do here. Um, it is the reason that I am here. And I absolutely stand on the shoulders of so many people who are here and want to add to some of those names. I came here and was uh, 
told that I was going to be teaching a course that had been taught by Pedro Nogueira. And uh, this was a course at 40AC that he designed. I've made it my own. But um, I came really here um, having um, w walking into a space that I didn't realize at that point had been created by the work of so many people. I really didn't know the history of AC. I had been at another campus a little bit farther south down the peninsula where we'd had a couple of those other fights where we just had the two books that were added to the humanities cultures. But I learned over time. I learned quickly, uh, maybe not as quickly as Barbara Christensen <laughs> Christian real realized we needed to. Um, so just really wanted to first acknowledge the joy and excitement that teaching is on this campus, and particularly the students that I get to work with every day. It's, uh, it's just an unbelievable privilege. On May 6, 1987, in his remarks on the 20th anniversary of the United States Constitution, Thurgood Marshall reminded us that the meaning of the Constitution was not forever fixed at the Philadelphia Convention. Rather, he argued with insight and conviction, the Constitution is an evolving document in his words, a living document, whose true miracle was not in its birth, but in its life. It is in this same spirit that I reflect upon and celebrate our American culture's requirement at the University of California, Berkeley, as a living and breathing requirement. And in some ways, that sounds like an oxymoron when I was writing this up and when I tried to say um, living and breathing requirement, I would kind of you know, laugh to myself. Definitionally, a requirement is that which is demanded or imposed as an obligation. And from my view, as an educator and scholar who has been privileged to work with over a 1,000 undergrads in American cultures classes, requirement simply does not resonate. Living, breathing, changing, evolving, challenging, these do. What began as a formal requirement for all UC Berkeley undergrads has become, has evolved into a central part of our intellectual life. And the heart of that life is inquiry. I'd like to focus my brief comments here today on the nature of that inquiry. Specifically, I want to briefly highlight some of the ways I believe American culture's courses, individually and collectively, nurture, drive, and sustain inquiry and the production of knowledge. In his work, The Quest for Certainty, John Dewey argued that every great advance in science and society has issued from a new audacity of imagination. We've got a lot of audacity in the room today and over the last few years. As I listened to Professor Simmons, Brilliant, and Martin today, I was reminded over and over of the audacity of imagination inherent in the birth of American cultures and of the advances in scholarship, understanding, and pedagogy that continue to this day. Inquiry is a process, a process central to all that we are and strive for here at UC Berkeley. At a minimum, the inquiry process involves asking, investigating, creating, and reflecting. In the context of an American cultures course, however, the inquiry process is far more profound. Students and teachers together are not just asking. They are asking meaningful and socially relevant, necessary questions. Our collective investigations involve seeking out complex, nuanced ways of explaining, pushing the boundaries of our disciplines and of the very concepts and categories that we use to organize our understandings, our lives, and our daily minute-to-minute -minute interactions. Over the past 20 years, that investigation has transformed our ideas and understandings about race, diversity, culture, ethnicity, and language. It has also transformed the very ways we teach and learn. The questions our undergraduates, my undergraduates, bring to the table each day are rarely simple ones. In fact, I think never. They demand inquiry that is open to new ways of thinking and that respects, listens to, and challenges the ideas of all involved, both teacher and student. In their efforts to create and sustain learning spaces where such critical inquiry can thrive, American culture's teachers have been a leading force in pedagogical innovation in their openness to the widest range of perspectives, experiences, and ideas, these classrooms have changed what we know, what we teach, and how we teach it. In many of these classrooms, dialogue, discourse, and debate are thriving. Alternative ideas are not just entertained, they are a core component of the intellectual community. This is not just by chance. As the Simmons Report originally proposed, American culture's courses should provide the intellectual tools to understand one's own particular cultural identity and those of others in their terms. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Just as I read that, I am reminded again of the audacity of imagination. Here we had no courses that could do this, and we were going to provide all of our students with those intellectual tools. And if providing those tools weren't enough, there's more. 
In doing so, AC courses were to provide and address theoretical and analytical issues, be integrative and comparative within the larger context of American society, and take substantial account of a range of racial and ethnic groups. Intellectual tools, theoretical, analytic, integrative, comparative, substantial. This is inquiry, critical inquiry, and this is the heart and soul of all of our work here. Several weeks ago in my American Cultures class, my students and I were discussing issues of diversity and access on the UC Berkeley campus. I asked them first to reflect on what they thought the core mission of Berkeley should be. This was actually quite hard for all of us to do. And given this, who should be here? As is usually the case, their insights were numerous and nuanced. The students generated an expansive list of the characteristics and criteria that should guide the campus in its admissions process. I then forced them to prioritize and take a stand, identifying the one quality they felt should be most powerfully considered in admitting a student body to our campus that would help us to achieve our vision. The number one quality broadly, those with creative and inquiring minds. And to use their words, those with unconventional ideas, who think outside the box, who can develop new ways of thinking, ones we haven't considered before, who constantly challenge themselves and others, and are constantly thinking and asking questions. For the past 20 years, students in American Cultures classes have been doing just that, constantly thinking and asking questions. That impact, while virtually impossible to measure, has consistently nurtured inquiry and innovative pedagogies for over two decades. And it, sorry, it has nurtured inquiry and innovative pedagogies in those requirements for two get decades. And in as such, it has been an evolving, living, and breathing document. In that spirit, I would like to close my time with the words and voices of those who have kept American cultures alive and changing, our students. Um, oh, I have a mic, too. Um, I'm really privileged to be standing in front of all of you distinguished guests today. Um, it's truly an honor. And I just wanted to share with you a little bit on what, how I felt as a Berkeley student about the American culture's requirement. Um, if someone were to, were to ask me what I felt about American culture classes, I would have to refer back to how many American cultures I've actually taken. Um, I'm only a sophomore in UC Berkeley, but to this day, I think I've taken four classes, so three more over the requirement. And <laughs> next fall, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to take another one, too. Um, and what draws me so much to these AC courses is not, it's not only the great professors and not only the students who have such brilliant minds, but it's the safe environment, the safe space that's created by these classes to, talk, to engage in dialogue about race, class, and gender. I mean, these are topics that we don't discuss on a day-to-day -day basis, but they're the very social mechanisms that are so embedded within our institutions that are, affecting, uh, the, that are affecting the resources that are available to people and what resources are not, the people, the type of people we interact with, the places that we go. And uh, at least for me, the classes that I've taken so far have really challenged me to look at my own personal experience and ask myself, what sort of social factors have led me to come here today and have the privilege of speaking in front of you? What sort of social factors have, effect have led you guys to be here today listening to me? And who's absent in this room? And I just, I mean, <sighs> I don't know. I just want to say that I'm genuinely, genuinely grateful for this opportunity that my university, the University of California, Berkeley, gave me the privilege to take these classes because I don't want to live the rest of my life in ignorance. And I think that these AC classes have definitely given me a chance to not do so. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is AJ Bawa, and I too am a Cal Berkeley student. I think back to a couple months ago when I was sitting in front of my computer and my internet connection wasn't working too well. I was on Air Bears, 
and I was sc scrolling down Telebears trying to find a class. You know, I found myself riding to the side of my computer, all the AC requirements that I thought were, you know, pretty fun. It was simply that, just a requirement. I'm an aspiring engineer, and had I not gone to Berkeley, I wouldn't find myself in an AC class. I look back to uh, when I first walked through Sailor Gate. And the first time going through that place, uh, I thought to myself, I'm a good kid. You know, I, I'm confident in my ability to work hard. I'm confident in my ability to look at people and not judge them <laughs> in, in a way that might be detri detrimental. But you see, when I took this AC class, I began to realize that the lens that I looked through every day wasn't so clear. <laughs> it was a little bit smudged, a little bit dirty. And I didn't know that. But what I loved about the AC class that I took was that it existed, that each one of us, you know, unless we take a class and we're challenged, has these certain biases. I came from a place that shaped who I am. And had I not been in this class, had it not been a requirement that I had to check off, I would find myself in classes like Physics 7A, simply number crunching. But I can do that and have an open mind. But what I like most about these classes is that I can have that, uh, I can come to Berkeley and learn a little bit more, but not only know that these biases exist, but have a helpful means to actually fix it, to analyze my subconscious and my prejudices so that I could actually grow. My name is A.J. Bowup, and I'm a changed UC Berkeley student. Thank you. <laughs> So thank you, and it's not easy to stand up in a crowd of peers, right? So thanks, guys, for doing that. Um, we're going to open now. We have less time than we'd hoped, but we do have 10 minutes for questions from the audience. And I have the mic where, if you could speak into the mic, we can record it. Um, so who would like to throw the first question at our faculty panel? Right. I didn't mean throw literally, Irina. So. Um, one of the major themes that came up at the at Tuesday's student AC forum was the level, the different levels of accountability and investment that students have in the different AC courses that they take. Um, there are some students that take it just as a check, and they take it pass no pass. Other students are incredibly invested, but their experience is affected by the other people in the room. So some of the suggestions that students came up with was requiring that the AC requirement be taken for a letter grade and that pass not pass not be not an option. Another suggestion was that there's a written component at the end to reflect on your experiences, something to make students accountable. What do you think are some concrete steps that we could take um, to increase student investment and accountability, all students in the AC courses that they take? Are you directing that at anyone in particular? No, just the panel. <laughs> the panel, go for it. Well, I do have I do have one thought, um, uh, particularly maybe because my course is a lower division course. I think about 20 to 30 percent at least of the students who take my course are simply doing it for a requirement. And one of the things that I found to really bring them on board is to model um, as best I can, which is hard as a professor because we're supposed to be professing, right? We're supposed to be we know, and now we are professing what we know. And I try to model that I'm always learning and I'm open to growing as well, and that I take that responsibility seriously. And I expect my students to take that responsibility seriously as well. And I think we heard from a student who was saying, I, I took that responsibility seriously and embraced it. Um, and so I think that it's not just about the pedagogy of what we say, but how we, and this is what AC is, you know, ha has so often done, is we change the way we teach, we change the way we are in the classroom. And it has absolutely demanded that of me, to be someone who is alongside my students growing and learning. And it's been my experience that students are more open to push themselves on that, regardless of whether or not it's um, pass, no pass. Would anybody can, else like to can I be a little contrarian and <laughs> heretical? What if you didn't require it? Right? What if you used a carrot rather than a stick, and the carrot being just excellent teaching in courses that drew teach students to it? I mean, it, it absolutely is a problem, what you're describing. You have two very different constituencies along these ends. Um, and you know, it's just, just a thought. Not necessarily I agree with that thought. But I, there, there's something. I mean, I come from 
was an undergraduate at the institution where uh, Professor Simmons now teaches, and there were no required courses. Um, and there's a long history for why that was. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there. At the Another question from the audience? <coughs> Great. David. This is problematic. I know everybody's names. This is strange. Uh, I just wanted to ask if the academic senate had to vote on this requirement again now, do you think it would pass so narrowly with the margin increase? I guess that's another way of asking if you think the faculty has uh, sort of broadened its, its uh, outlook a little bit. <laughs> no, no. Uh, let me be very honest. Um, I, I, I think we probably have some other people in here who are, who are better equipped to answer that than me. I, I don't see myself as a, an expert on the uh, internal workings or the zeitgeist of the academic senate, since I very rarely attend meetings. Um, and I see people here who I know are, are in, have been very active. So I mean, I think it might be. Anyone here who's a bit more active than I am want to has a sort of a response to that? I have no idea. The Berkeley faculty is such a diverse and, you know, uh, unwieldy and unpredictable animal that I couldn't, I, mean, I would think that one of the reasons it passed, they probably packed the hall. The few times that I know I have really been to a meeting, someone says, you have to show up, brother. Uh, we're voting on the blah, blah, okay? <laughs> are you down? Okay, yeah, I'll be there. Um, and so those are the meetings I tend to show up for. Um, you know, just a regular business meeting. I don't, or you know, just regular meetings. I tend not to show up too much for those. And uh, Mark, have you ever? <laughs> In its current form, I don't think it would pass. Okay. I mean, I, I have no basis other than my own opinion. I think that one possibility would it expand the kind of categories that were at, at issue at, at the time. That's one issue. The, the other issue that strikes me that there was, I think, a more compelling claim to be made for what Takaki called multicultural illiteracy 20 years ago than you could maybe make today. And some of the points that Professor Simmons raised about people who brought up other forms of illiteracy that if we're going to have one required course, why shouldn't it be a course on X or Y? That I think those might be more salient, especially in today's context. I mean, economic illiteracy, scientific illiteracy, classes on global warming. I wonder if those would have greater traction in this particular environment. So I think you would hear a lot more of that to this, to, to today. In addition to, well, how do we expand these categories that we've sort of codified and reified in the process from 20 years ago. It's probably important to have a voice up here. I, 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 I probably disagree with almost everything he just said. Um, so I do believe that it would pass. And I also, um, I don't know that actually the nature of the claims that would be made and how they would resonate um, would have changed that much. Um, and I think that there would be deep dialogue around if we were positing a requirement around economics or health. But I think um, the evidence that we would rally and the debate that we would have around the importance of maintaining a requirement like this, I think the claims are even, yeah, the evidentiary warrant would be strong. Let me get somebody I don't know. <laughs> or do I? I do, don't I? <laughs> Hi, this is uh, for everybody, but particular, particularly Professor Brilliant. The mission statement of the UC system that was developed in the 1970s states three main goals, which are research, teaching, and public service. How do you feel that the AC can not only address these three concerns, but in fact integrate them together? That's one of the, one of the issues that we constantly talk about um, in, in, in our AC subcommittee me meetings, is, is, is it does seem to me that, that the, the, the burden that's placed on a single requirement and a single director to bear that burden is, is tremendous. And, and I think it's really hard to expect AC to carry that kind of burden. And I prefer to keep it focused on curricular content. I mean, 
thinking that AC courses should also be involved in service learning um, and, 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 and these other areas, I think runs the risk of, 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 of really spreading both the faculty who teach it thin and the requirement I I itself thin. I think that, that those other areas need to be addressed across the curriculum. There should be other ways to think about that. And, and AC simply cannot carry that weight without sort of crumbling beneath it. Um, like, can, can we take, I think we've time for uh, maybe two more questions. So, I am wondering um, why well, I know usually, because it's an, a requirement, the AC classes are usually quite large, which means there are often discussion sections, which means there are often graduate students who are actually facilitating and mediating the um, actual discussions, the meaty discussions that go on in response to the information presented in the lectures. Um, so I'm wondering if um, the role of the graduate student um, had any part in the conversations around the AC requirement, um, if there has ever been kind of considered a training for graduate students to be able to facilitate these conversations. Um, I guess the role that you see them playing, you know, if you have GSIs, how you um, train uh, them to kind of engage in these very difficult conversations, sometimes on topics that they are not trained in at all. Ron Choi might be able to actually say something about that. Ron? I do know you. <laughs> Uh, I'm Ron Choi. Uh, uh, my recollection of this topic was that uh, uh, these courses weren't supposed to be different in that respect, in lots of respects, from any other courses. And because this was a requirement, it was not, uh, there was, it had no base in the departments. In fact, the American Culture Center had power over nothing. Everybody who did this was a volunteer. They taught, they structured their course however they wanted. We got what we got. Uh, I was just glad we had enough seats. Now, the, 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 the distribution of class sizes was always an issue. Uh, when you're going for quantity, you know, Wheeler Hall is a big class. Uh, you, need a hun you, need 700, seven, you need seven classes of 100 each to make Wheeler Hall. That means I need seven more instructors. Uh, you start thinking like this, you have classes of 50, well, you know, uh, I, I got to have come up with 8,000 seats. Well, if I had 50 seats a class, how many teachers do I need? Uh, they just didn't have the bodies. Simple as that. And, and working with Ron over the years early on in my experience here, I can say that graduate students were often part of the, the kinds of training sessions we were involved in where um, ideas were bubbling up about classes uh, being taught. And um, so it, my memory is that there were, it was more informal, but there were often graduate students working with professors and professors attending these uh, training sessions had graduate students um, alongside them who were working to help to create these classes. So, you know, this is one of the things, and I know um, in, in the class that Mark and I do, um, Mark especially is good at this. Work, we work very closely with students, um, with graduate students. I mean, you, we don't just let them <laughs> show up and go for what you know. Um, you know, you have, you have weekly meetings, you spend a lot of time engaging in what some people might call training um, to enable them to teach the material um, and to, you know, think about a whole range of issues. So um, at least in the course that we do, and Mark is really good at this, uh, thinking about what graduate students need to know uh, in, in order to go into a classroom and deal with these kinds of things, you know. So can I extend everyone's patience just for two more minutes, even though the bell's ringing, because Jude, a student subcommittee member to the American Cultures Committee, um, has had his hand up for a long time, so I want to recognize that. Uh, I have a question from the AACC student forum. And the question is, how can we incorporate more transparency and student decision making into the approval process for courses? And also, are there additional mechanisms that can be created to reevaluate existing AC courses and improve faculty accountability? 
Anybody got a quick answer for that? <laughs> looking over at Mark, he's looking over at me. We can talk, Jude. I mean, unfortunately, well, not necessarily unfortunately, but as um, I'm currently the chair of the subcommittee, and Jude knows this, um, but there's pretty clear um, decision-making processes about how many students are included, how the decisions um, are made. And definitely, I think, um, depending on individual leadership and makeup of the committee, that can certainly change some things. I think the important thing would be not that for someone like myself to know, or Mark on the committee, or Victoria, would be what are the concerns about where is the lack of transparency? And where is, are there senses that student voices are not being accounted for or heard? And then what might we do? to take those into consideration. So I would, I don't mean to be flipping the question back at you, but it's not just what would we do, but what are the concerns that students have about what's not being done right now so that we could be careful and um, specific about thinking about that. The, the other part of Jude's question um, about sort of flexing the requirement, I think that it raises, and, and, and it goes to David, uh, David's point as well, there's, and it's a procedural question that, and it's a debate that we have in our meetings that you sit in on is, you know, this sort of the Scalia-esque kind of how strict constructionist should we be about this particular requirement that stands before us versus how much sort of flexibility should we allow for, as I sort of alluded to at the end, kind of different notions of salient categories of, of American cultures. And, and I don't know where the boundaries are where you sort of procedurally, if it's a policy matter, when we stretch it to the point that you know, there's lots of great classes out there, whether they meet the requirement. If we stretch those great classes to meet the requirement, it raises a whole issue about whether or not it has to go before the academic senate again, I would think, procedurally, although there are people here that could better speak to how that works. But I imagine it's a complicated sort of policy kind of question. Um, so. It's also, I just would want to end with a comment um, so that we're ending not just on a kind of policy procedural question, but I mean, exactly what Mark, Mike, Mark is saying there is about the kind of intellectual questions that students have perspectives and voices that they want to be heard. They have things that they want to be learning in classes. They have the kind of class, they have ideas about the kind of classes they want to take. And we have a requirement, but yet we're discussing, well, what kind of courses and ideas embody that. So it's a procedural question at a minimum, but far more dynamically, it's an intellectual inquiry question. So, yeah, I, I would just add to that that there was a book just published two weeks ago by Yale University Press by a former Berkeley faculty member, Robert Post. And it's called For the Common Good. And it's a study of, it's a 150 page study of what contemporary academic freedom is in the United States. And one of the sections of that book is on the academic freedom of students. So in a, in a theoretical way, I think it would be of interest to you to, to take a look at that. Do you know where Post stood on AC back in that day? How he voted? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Against. So it's, it's hard to follow all, all those fabulous final comments that the panel have made. But I think the whole tenor of the comments that you just, you just offered to us um, really speak to the ways in which the AC course is a unique student and faculty experience and it is still that site not only for difficult dialogue, not only provocative intellectual questions, but for conversations that move all our students forward in their larger social lives. So thank you for all being here today. It's a pleasure to see so many wonderful friendly faces and um, visit the AC Center, 120 Wheeler, and look at our next semester's curriculum on online. It looks wonderful. So thank you all for being here. <laughs>